welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, where we discuss e-commerce issues and whether our guest today automated, delegated, or eliminated them and why. Your host is Will Christensen, co-founder of Data Automation. And again, welcome to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. Welcome everyone to this episode of Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. This is our Founder Stories podcast season where we explore the beginnings of some of your favorite SaaS companies. And today I am so excited to introduce someone who I've honestly been a huge fan of for quite a while. And I'm, I'm a huge fan of the software that he's in the middle of right now. Um, I'd like to welcome Zeb Evans, who is the CEO of ClickUp to our show. And I'm going to read his bio here in a second, but welcome, Zeb. Thanks for having me, Will. Super excited to be here. Awesome. So Zeb Evans is a serial entrepreneur, a libertarian that started several software companies uh, with over $100 million in revenue. Currently, he's the founder and CEO of ClickUp, a productivity platform where people plan their work. And it's been interesting to kind of hear ClickUp's name in the marketplace, see what we're seeing out there. I'm, I'm watching agency owners. Uh, we were just talking about this before before we jumped on and started recording. I'm seeing agency owners drop like flies. They're going right in, and, and, and they're basically dropping some of the other software that's out there for your platform. And I'm honestly excited to see the traction that it's seeing in the world. Data automation has it on the docket to evaluate and begin to change over there as well. So this, is, this was not a planned endorsement. Zeb did not pay me to say that. So I'm honestly super excited to be to be talking to someone about a piece of software that we plan to integrate and automate with inside our, our own company. So, so Zeb, tell me a little bit more about what your software does for people. Yeah, so ClickUp is, is an all-in-one platform for productivity that has very customizable features. And so what that means is that, you know, traditionally the problem with productivity software is you have to use so many different applications for, for all of your work. Each one has a different specific use case, whether it be for marketing or for engineering or for product development, and then usually also a different segment, meaning some for SMB, some for larger companies, some for personal use. We wanted to build a, a platform where you could put all of your work in one place, regardless of, of who you are. It is building for everyone and for everything as well. Wow. Wow. I mean, we were talking about this a minute ago as well. Everything to everyone seems like a really poor strategy. I mean, I, I hear so many people talking about, you know, niche down, niche down, focus, focus, focus. And and you seem to have found a way to focus on everything to some degree or another. I'm excited to to see where it goes. So so would you say is that is that the number one thing that differs you from the, the other productivity softwares that are out there in the marketplace? Yeah, I mean, generally you compete or we compete with project management software. So think Asana, Trello, and then we compete with no code software. So think, you know, like Monday um, or Airtable. We also compete in the docs and wiki knowledge base, you know, like Notion, Confluence, Google Docs. And then we directly compete with all of the other time tracking and productivity applications that you use today for resource management. Um, so our application replaces all of those and puts them into one. And, and so, you know, it, it is a tool that is somewhat of a sandbox. Some people use it just for task management, right? Very simple task management. And then we have, you know, large enterprises using us to, to send rockets out in space. So it's, it's a very <laughs> wide variety of use cases. But yeah, the premise is that it's, it's software that will work for everyone and everything. So I love... Wow. I, I mean, my mind is kind of racing about a billion different directions here. So literally people do rocket science inside ClickUp? Is that what we're, is that what we're saying here? Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> people, people ship rockets. They, they, they build airplanes, um, build cruise ships. I mean, literally anything you could imagine. So, I mean, I, I've been excited about other episodes before, but I'm, I'm really excited to hear this. So tell us your origin story. How did you fit into the picture of founding, uh, founding ClickUp? What, what was this? At a, I've, first of all, I've been a, a lifelong entrepreneur. Since I was three or four years old, I was that kid that was building things and selling things, getting in trouble at school for, for selling candy and things like that. So I've got some type of business or hustle I was doing every year. My company prior to this was a, a social media like automation and reporting company where we kind of had a SaaS model before I really knew what, what SaaS was, meaning like recurring revenue. 
And through that, we started my project management journey. I started with, with Basecamp. It was just myself and, and one other person. And then we ended up with like a hundred people and you had, you know, Asana for marketing, Trello for your boards. You had your to-do list still on um, Todoist for reminders. And then we had our notes in three different applications and chat elsewhere. And it just felt like all of these applications that were intending to save you time to make you more productive were really making you less productive. So like, that's where the idea came from is why can't we have one app for our entire business and everybody communicate and, and put all of your work in, in one place. So long story short, I, um, I actually had a near death experience and I realized that company is not what I want to be doing right now. And so I dropped what I was doing. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina and moved out to Silicon Valley because I had always wanted to be out there for the, the aura and just feel and energy uh, attracted me for, for tech, obviously. And we got there and we were going to do something completely different. We were going to do a Craigslist competitor where you could pay in app and, and remove sketchiness from Craigslist. But before we got started, we wanted to finish the vision of ClickUp, which was just an internal project at the time. And we did that and we got a month or two into it and we realized there's, there's more for us to do, but also it just kind of started growing organically through us sharing, sharing it with people in Palo Alto. And, and that's kind of the story of how it became an actual product. Wow. So you essentially looked at it and you said, wait a minute, I am in the middle of something I don't want to be in the middle of, had a near death experience, looked at it and said, wait a minute, wait a minute. somebody's got to build something that replaces this mess of tools that we're getting all over the place. And that was it. That, that was where, that was where yeah. you got the idea for the software. Exactly. It's, I always tell people, you know, I never wanted to get into, this is the most competitive software market in the world by, by 3x. The next most competitive is, is CRM, but the collaboration space is, is by far the most competitive. So it's, it's not a market you want to get into. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise it. But fortunately, that everyone for every, and everything model started really taking fruit and, and the next generation of software, because that's, I think, where software is headed, is this convergence of tools rather than like divergent individual pieces of software. Beautiful. So, I mean, did you have moments where you looked at it and said, I mean, I, I'm just imagining what the MVP meeting must have looked like. Like, we're going to be everything for everybody, but we have to actually build an MVP. What did that look like? What, what, did, what did some of those initial MVP meetings look like? It was always about just making everything flexible. So no matter what we did, we, we had a vision for if, if our company was a thousand people right now, when it was, you know, five people, would this work for us? Would this scale with us? And so with every decision we made, that's, that's how we were thinking from, you know, that two person team up to 2000 people. And it's not easy to do when you haven't been there before, right? It's, you don't really know exactly what your workflow is going to look like. So we weren't perfect at it. Um, but as long as we had that vision of flexibility and customization, we, we knew that we could get there someday. And so we built our infrastructure always to be able to turn on and off every feature, making them very independent from each other so that you could do that. And, and today, even, you know, not all of that is, is even accessible in, in the UI. We kind of have a, a next phase of our product that, that we'll release soon that really does give you that ultimate flexibility in every little thing. But today, there is still lots of it that's very, very customizable, meaning if you don't use it, you can turn it off. I, I mean, are you hinting at like almost a low code, no code productivity? Like when you say like turning it off, like I mean, don't tell me anything that's too confidential, but like <laughs> I heard a ringing, like just that on the wind there. I mean, can you hint at that? Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, I, I don't, the, the terminology low code or no code, it's, it's such a buzz term nowadays. It, it really is. And at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's definitely, we're not going to the low code approach where, you know, you will code your own applications. I think there's players that, that do that and do that well already. What we're really focused on is productivity. We're focused on your work. You know, so so it's to do that, you, you can't really, you know, build this a no code tool because you have too much flexibility. And I think that's the problem that some of our competitors are always going to have when they're trying to replace you know, your productivity stack is is there's too much flexibility. There's there's too much of, you know, it's just like a dot. Right. And, and I don't th see that as as, you know, saving people time, which which is our mission, because there's so much configuration going on. So, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, there, there will be some of that but a very in a very limited approach more so just just bringing everything together in a simple one sheet configuration panel you know where you can tell us who you are and we can really customize the platform for you rather than you having to to build it yourself wow okay so i, I mean this idea of, of 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 
creating almost a, a, a white canvas to some degree or another for productivity. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and then you not having to customize it and build it yourself because, you know, that's, that is the conundrum, right? It's, is some people don't want to do that. Some people love it, but other, other people don't really want to have to customize it themselves. So we will do that for you uh, eventually. Got it. So tell me a little bit, I mean, where, where did the name come from? Well, where did, where did the name ClickUp come from? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, we um, originally, I had always thought of, you know, we did social media before this, right? So Clicks was, was always top of mind to us. And honestly, I had uh, trademarked the name prior to that, uh, ClickUp, you know, increasing people's clicks on, on social media, essentially. And it just stuck with us. It really did. You know, the, the fake answer is, is that we, we wanted to, you know, there were so many clicks in other platforms, we had to click around all the time and we want to decrease that. Some people say that and, and you know, it, it is true that we, we do want to decrease the, the clicks, but the reality is it was, it was just a name we had for a while that really stuck with us. Love it, love it. Well, and, and sometimes that's the best name, right? That, when it resonates, when it resonates with the audience, I, I've discovered, I mean, and our, our listeners are often entrepreneurs, you know, I want to point out that the name is important, but don't get stuck on it. You know, you really could call it anything as long as it resonates to some degree or another. It's memorable to some degree or another. And, and don't be afraid to rebrand. I cannot tell you how many people who they get a year or two into it and they're like, eh, we're going to call it something else. And they just change the name. I mean, think about Monday.com. Does anybody, <laughs> did you know? If you're listening, did you know that Monday.com wasn't? I'm not even going to tell you. You're going to have to go Google it. Monday.com was not Monday.com before. And, and, and honestly, it, it, it's fading out of memory. People don't even remember that it was called something else. So don't get too stuck on the name. Anything you want to add to that? If you know, we're speaking to our listeners in terms of getting too stuck on names. I mean, I would just double click on it. It, it really is something where you mentioned it perfectly. It's, it ha does have to be memorable. And I believe it also has to be easy to Google. Like you, you, it can't be, you know, Monday is, is really risky, right? It's, it's hard to Google, but, but when you can buy all the ad space there and people are doing it, then, you know, that, that's, that's not a bad scenario to have. But I would say make it easy to Google and easy to spell and also very memorable. And, and then you win. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter as much as you think it does, for sure. Yeah. We were sitting down looking at the name data automation and trying to decide, okay, should we call, what, what should we call ourselves? Because we wanted to be an agency that focused on automating manual processes. And uh, our copywriter came in and said, hey, what about data automation? And I was like, is that domain name actually available? Like, really? And, and we went and looked and we ended up purchasing it from somebody who was squatting on it. Mm. Um, and, and I'll tell you right up, we, we paid $2,400 for it. I, 20, so, somewhere between $2,100 to, to $2,400. And I don't often advocate paying that much for a domain name because I don't feel like it's that it's that important to have it right there. But I was amazed at, at the level of, oh, I think we've heard of you before and, you know, just different things like that. So super important. Uh, honestly, we, we immediately went out and purchased data automation with one A from, from the standpoint of, of spelling it, you know, you know, that leading and trailing A. It's kind of interesting to kind of see that. So, so really powerful uh, thoughts there. I love that. Let, let's bring it back in and, and let's let's talk more more click up here. What were the moments as you began to have those initial MVP discussions and look at, at some of that? What were moments that made you realize exactly what the software needed? Where it was like, oh, we really need kind of that Mark Zuckerberg moment when he realized it needed relationship status. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that to preface it, the vision was always there. Like where we are today, I actually had this vision from from early on. It just it just took a long time for us to get here. You know, it's it's not uh, it's it's not easy building software. Obviously, it it takes a long time. So every MVP that we had, it was just about like you know we knew that per perfection is possible, but we'd rather choose progress over perfection. And that's what I tell everybody. It's like it, you really don't have to be perfect at first. So as long as you have like the the overall vision there. The ways to get there can be done in, in little baby steps each time and you just iterate really quickly. So it, it was more so of like, I think I know what I want. I think I know I want this. Do other people want this was, was more of the problem that I had is, you know, is, is my vision actually what people want? And, you know, fortunately, most of it was, but a lot of it still wasn't. And, and we would learn from shipping things, right? We would ship, we would ship something and people would be like, you know, what the hell are you thinking? I, I wanted it this way. <laughs> What did you do to close the feedback loop? I mean, it, it, when, when you're talking about shipping it and you're talking about, you know, the, the, the user feedback, I mean, are, are you a fan of the lean startup? 
of some of the that lean startup movement. How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, I, I love the lean startup methodology. I mean, we we've been lean from the beginning. Um, I, like I, I will say, it's it's the feedback is just paramount importance to us, and I think it should be more in in other SaaS products as well. Um, your users do know what's best, contrary to to popular belief. Um, there is there's our exceptions, and especially in hardware, it's it's very different. But in software, like your users do know what they want. And if you listen to them, um, you'll build a much better product. So we've always just focused on listening to our users. And there's ways to do that without having it infiltrate like you're thinking too much to where, you know, you're building a product just what your users want. And the way we do that is, is we think about like what we would want in our vision. And we will either ship it, ship the feature and get feedback, or we'll send out a survey and get user testing there on the spot and hear what people have to say. And, and it's usually just like thumbs up or thumbs down. It's very clear on whether we were wrong or, or not on what we're building. Beautiful. So what do you do? I mean, as you look at it, one of the things they talk about in the Lean Startup is um, listening to what they want and what they want, right? Listen to what they tell you what they want and what they actually want in terms of like how they create real live scenarios or test it in the wild, right? Because everybody's like, oh, yeah, I definitely want that feature. And then they roll out the feature and they don't really use it. So so what do you do to make sure that you're listening to the qualitative and the quantitative uh, data that you're getting back? It's a good question. Um, I mean, we have different platforms and avenues for doing that. Like we have we have Canny, which is uh, a really great feedback board where, you know, you can go and upvote feature requests. And and so that's, that's both qualitative and quantitative because we have numbers for how many people upvoted it type of users up, upvoted it? Is it, our, is it our really active, engaged user base? Or is it just people that are you know floating around from productivity tool to productivity tool? So that's helped us a ton. We also use a uh, data analytics platform. We use Pindo. There's a ton out there, though. I wouldn't necessarily recommend that one. But any of those will give you a lot of great data on how people are using and engaging with, with your product. And, and you'll know pretty quickly whether or not something works or, or it doesn't work. Many times, it's not just about the data. It's not just about like, Hey, is somebody clicking on this? Is somebody actively using on this? It may be a more around the product positioning, the marketing around it. Like, do they know? Do they understand the value of of using this? And and that's kind of a light bulb that we've had sometimes is is just giving them examples of how to use it. Do you, do you full, so so maybe it's not so much a problem. That's very interesting. So when you look at shipping a feature, shipping a product, getting that out in front of them, sometimes when you hand that user a pen. You got to be like, did you know that you could actually write a love note with this? Like, like mm-hmm. this is a love note pen. So, so you got to go a step further than just handing them the pen. You've got to tell them what that can, what's, what's the power of that pen. That's really powerful. Really, really powerful. Exactly. And, th- and that's what we're, we're doubling down on today. Um, you know, is, is we've, we've sprinted really fast in features and certainly, you know, you, you, some places you have to neglect a little bit and, and that user journey and behavior and, and coaching is, is something we've kind of left out for, for a while. And so we're going back and, and really making sure that, you know, everybody understands what the values are for the feature rather than just the people that can figure it out on their own. Awesome. So let's go back in time a little bit. How did you keep your family afloat while you got things started? Did you have, you know, this massive pile of savings? It sounds like you had a pretty traumatic experience right before. Like those generally don't, aren't cheap, you know, generally speaking, you know, I, I've found that, that that could be quite expensive. So tell me, what did you do to keep your family afloat while you got started? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I did start that other company and we I, I saved some money from that company. So I was able to to start ClickUp with with that funds from that company. And also I'm, I'm from North Carolina, so I had no clue you could even raise capital. I'd never even heard of, heard of that before. Um, so we were forced to do it ourselves. You know, I was I was all in on this. I, I bet every every dollar I had on on ClickUp. And, you know, it was it was scary for sure. You know, you, you, you're you're going up against these these massively funded competitors. And when we got into this space, you know, we realized how how tough it was going to be. But we were always just focused on on being sustainable and you know being profitable at the end of the day. I mean, profit has become a bad word in Silicon Valley. You know, it's it's just like we we talk to many people and, and we're the only company. We, we talk to you know VCs and and they ask you know, how much money are you burning. We're like we're not burning money. We're 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 profitable, and they're just shocked because they haven't seen that before. Uh, so so. I would say I, I can't, you know, advocate enough for, for becoming profitable and, and, you know, doing things sustainably because you're going to have a lot less stress and you're going to have a lot more control over your own destiny. 
Yeah. So when you got, I mean, you moved to Silicon Valley, the, the world of, of VCs and, and, and that, I mean, when you got there, was everybody like, wait a minute, like you, you have, like you're doing this all on your own? Like, were they flipping out? Did you, wait, did you have initial, you know, offers for investment? What did that look like? Yeah. I, early on when you'd have these nibbles, uh, I didn't really know what I was doing. And, you know, you talk to these people and I was just always open with them about what we were doing. And, and nobody wants to fund somebody building software for everyone and everything, kind of like you were mentioning. I mean, it's just not the smart <laughs> thing to do, right? No, no, nobody would do that. So we had to do it ourselves. We really did. And then when we started getting traction, you know, you start hearing some things, but I, I never really seriously entertained it. It was, it was more so just like, look, this is working for us. I have no time to fundraise right now. We're obsessed with product. I just want to focus on this. And, and we did. We just focused on, on what we can control on our own destiny, you know, until until we really started to scale. Have you had any like seed rounds or anything like that? Have you? I mean, it, it, I was looking and I thought I saw a few things like that. But um, yeah. you know, so, so eventually you decided it was time to, to bring on some of that. But you were probably able to get an evaluation that made it a lot more palatable. So the seed rounds, to be clear, were just were just myself. So that was that was me writing our own our own safe notes from from my previous company. But we did raise our Series A uh, about a month ago. So my perspective changed um, when I met our our investor today, who who you know f- kind of founded PayPal with with Elon Musk and Peter Peter Thiel, and then went on to find fi- on Yammer. He was an entrepreneur himself, right? And and so he kind of changed my perspective on on fundraising a little bit because I, every every VC I met, I just I just didn't like. I I really just didn't. You know, it was just like. It's like they weren't really like real people, real entrepreneurs, as bad as that sounds. It was just, it was just like it kind of just just felt a little bit artificial. And so, you know, when when we we met David and our other investors that we have today, it was it was a lot of synergies there. And our other investors are our users of our product, and, and you know, we got along really well with them, just just uh, you know, philosophically as well. And so, when you find those right people, that's what it's all about. And, and that was when we decided, okay, you know, we. We do have our product there now. We do definitely have product market fit, and we have uh, you know these competitors that are are really trying to stomp on us right now. So it's it's time to fight back, and and that was ultimately what what led us to raise our our thirty five million Series A about a month ago was just to be able to fight back. Yeah, well, and you've done a decent job of that. I I'm not surprised that you have people trying to stomp on on some of the success that's there, at all, and and I'm honestly excited. So uh, tell me. A little bit about your family. Are you married, single? Where where do you where do you fall in, in the range of uh, of familial ties? I'm single. I'm married to, married to my business. Married, married to your business. To All right. All of our users. It's like that's that's my day and night. You know, it's it it really is. I'm, this is my obsession right now. It's my baby. It's it's my family. And and yeah, I wouldn't have it any any other way right now. I love it. I love it. I love it. I, I always like to ask about that because I love to hear about some of the sacrifices that family members make to get there. And, and you've sacrificed a lot to get there. So it's it's a powerful thing. If you were to say one thing that you feel like you may have sacrificed, but that are now getting back around to to, to, to pour as much energy into this, what would it be? What would be one thing that you would say, ah, oh, you know what, I did have to set this aside a little bit to make to make this a dream come true? relationships relationships with people and just in general outside of the company you know it's that's just something that that when you're obsessed and you're really living and breathing things it's it's just not really sustainable to to do you kind of have to become unbalanced a little bit um so you know i'm starting to, to build those relationships again and spend more time there but at the end of the day i you know this is this is who i am like i i, I wouldn't have it any other way i feel like i was i was kind of put here to, you know to, to to build things and create things so so this is me this is what makes me the most happy everybody's different you know yeah no and i love that i that isn't it beautiful that the world can be full of different people that that love and, and chase different things that we would be in in, in such a hard place if we were all the same. So tell me about some of the difficulties that you overcame as you as you pushed on this. You know, and, and then I want to hear how you ever overcame them. What would you say some of the biggest challenges were? Yeah, I mean, you know, there's there's fires every day behind the scenes, right? So we're we're the way I look at my job is is I'm a firefighter now. It's it, it's just it's you know problem this fix problem fix fix problem. Um, so that happens. That's con- constant. Some of the, the biggest ones, you know, that, that we've had, I would say definitely are, I mean, early on when, when we weren't profitable, we were running out of, out of money, you know, and I had self-funded it. So there wasn't anybody else to go get a check from. We were very close to running out and, and you know, we probably had two months left, a little bit less than two months left. 
And I was just like, shit, like, you know, how, how I've got to change my mind back to the business mindset because I was so obsessed with product. And I was like, let's let's just do a, pro a promotion, you know, because I, I love promotions and I love discounts. But SaaS products normally don't do that stuff. Um, but we love that. You know, if anybody emails us, we will give anybody a discount. We love giving discounts. I think it makes people happy. It gives brand loyalty to users. So we started it. We started doing a bunch of random discounts, you know, like for holidays and things like that. And, you know, believe it or not, in those, those two months after we started doing that, we, we were profitable that second month. It really was just shocking to me how, you know, we were a freemium product. And so we had all of these free users and we just didn't think people were ready to pay for it. But when we gave them a reason to pay, people started paying. And it was just it was just shocking to me. So that was like one of the biggest, biggest problems we had and, and how we, we overcame it. Um, there's always, always stuff on the engineering side that are, you know, people say are impossible to do. Lots of the things that we've done should be impossible to do, especially in the time frame that we've done it. But you find the right people and the people that believe they can do it and the people that are obsessed with it and work really, really hard and you can get it done. You know, you really can. And, and, and if that person can't, you ask somebody else that can and, and you'll end up finding a way. So I have to dig into that one a little more because that's one of my actually, you know, I look back at when, when you guys got started and I was like, there's no way. How, how did you overcome the everything to everyone time frame on building out some of these features? What was it that got you? I mean, that honestly, when I look at the software, I look how powerful it is. I look at how bug free it is. I mean, obviously we, everybody's got bugs and you're going to run into them, but but the level of quality that you've created in the time frame you've created it, it is really fascinating. Tell us about that. Yeah, there's, I mean, so, so to, to back up for more context is at my previous company, I thought to develop faster, you hire more engineers. And that's what we did. We, we probably had 50 engineers for a product that, you know, should have, we could have done with two today. And I got in, I, I, I read all the books. We did all the perfect principles, development principles that everybody advocates for. And that just slowed us down tremendously and hiring more people slowed us down. So I learned that lesson there. And I was the opposite when I came out of that. I was like, look, we are not going to do any of these principles. We're going to trust people to do their best work. And we're going to work really, really hard. And that is part of the secret sauce. Another part of the stuff that I, I like, you know, not going too technical, but most people, you know, they have engineers that that basically write the code on the front end and they beautify it on the front end. They make it pretty on the front end. We have people that just specialize in making it pretty. So that's the time. That's that 80 percent time that consumes some of these engineers because they're just not, you know, they're not meant to do that. They're more of like the programming type. So we have, you know, separate teams and separate use cases for different things that really allows us to go faster. And then the last thing I'll say is everybody advocates, you know, for 100% test coverage, which means, you know, like automating all of this, these tests so that you can make everything perfect. And that does end up slowing things down tremendously because when you have teams working with each other, you're going to break somebody else's test. And it's not necessarily breaking a feature or creating a bug. It's just breaking the test. And so you've got to go back and fix that other test. And we dealt with that so much at my previous company that this, we were just like, look, we're going to do really heavy manual testing on most things. Some things we will test on the back end, especially that, that are critically, but for the general, it's, it's mostly manual testing. So you created a manual process that sped things up. This automate, delegate, eliminate, ladies wrong, and gentlemen, right there. The wrong podcast for that. No, no, actually. So one of the things I, I advocate is recognizing when it's time to automate and when it's time to do it manually. That's why that's why we that's why we talk about it. Automate, delegate, eliminate. You you have to look at the true impact you're having. So when you say principles, are you talking scrum and some of those other things? Like you're you you're like, I just I'm throwing those out the window. Yeah, I mean strict strict scrum, right? We we still do agile, you know, in general, but but really strict stuff. Especially like, you know, pair programming. And, and other de just development principles in general, like, you know, writing the perfect code, is, which is so subjective. But, but really testing has, it was, it was a huge part of it that, that we did on a previous company that just, I, I just chose not to do here. Uh, but you're exactly right, because we are going back now and we're adding tests. It's just when you're in this hyper growth mode where you're changing things and you're breaking things real a lot. Like, you, you, there's no point in doing it there because you're going to break things so much that you might as well just do it when you're done or at least when you have like more of the product there. And, and that's what we're going back and doing right now. So it's powerful because it, it, it looks like you powered through 
a phase of the business because you were going about creating everything for everyone. You powered through and didn't create as bulletproof a product. You focused on some of those core features. You rapidly iterated. I bet there are still things inside that you're like, oh, you probably should have taken care of that a while ago. And I mean, that's powerful, 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 powerful. So, you know, depending on what you're looking at as far as your MVPs are concerned, looking at, at, at where those pieces go, you got to pay attention to, to what you're building and spend the right amount of time on, on what you're doing. That's that's awesome. Yeah, it's always just been product first, you know, product, product first and users first. So we listen to our users religiously and then we iterate really quickly. And I, I can't advocate for that enough. What did you do? So, so this is not a question I usually ask. What did you did you do like an app sumo launch? What did you do to get your first, you know, 100, 500 thousand users? We've been all 100 percent organic up until about three months ago. So what that means is virality of people just telling us, uh, telling you about us. I mean, generally, you know, you don't really hear about ClickUp unless you know somebody that's using it. And so our users have been our, our biggest marketing engine that, that we have by far. When we when we started originally, how do you get those first hundred users? Content, you know, content is is king. Everybody says that it's it's still true today. Uh, we relied heavily on SEO and you know just random um, keywords that people would be searching that that are pretty easy to hit for. And when we hit with those, you know, you you start getting your first users, and then you kind of get this flywheel uh, of growth that happens after that. So, so content, I mean, were you writing blog posts about productivity? Like, yeah. like, is that what, is that what we're talking about? Like, like get, get make, make a really kick butt blog post, get it published on medium and the users will come like, what, like, tell me, what did you do? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's exactly what it was. We, there, there were random things too, that weren't really necessarily related to productivity. Um, a couple of those would be like, uh, we, we ranked really high for a period of time for motivational quotes. And so when people would search motivational quotes, you know, they'd find a ClickUp article and then they would kind of get looped into our content there. And just so happens that's a pretty good market for people that, you know, they want project manager software. This helps you get more done. Um, so the people are looking for motivational stuff. You know, they didn't getting, getting a lot of people there. So there's there's tons of those random things that we've ranked for over time. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, it, Obviously, the lowest hanging fruit is going for, you know, project management software. How do I manage my products? How do I be more productive? Um, those types of things. That's fascinating. So were your first marketing hires all, you know, SEO guys or, or, or content people? Like what, 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 how did you, what did you decide? I mean, obviously you have some experience in the past with that. So you, you knew a little bit of where to go that, that direction. Yeah, we, we, we figured it out. You know, we kind of learned, learned by trial and error and learned by doing. We didn't have any marketing people for the first, you know, two years that we were around. We really just hired marketing, uh, our first marketing hires about nine, nine months ago. And so I was, I was doing most of the marketing. I was doing the branding and, and I love doing that. And, you know, I, I still do some of that. Um, but we obviously have, you know, an awesome market, marketing team now. And, and they were able to, to scale it up way beyond we were ever to, to scale up those efforts. Love it. I love it. When you compare the business now to the business in the early days, what was it like? Man, it's, you know, it's funny how it happens because you don't really notice change when it happens over time, right? When kind of things just start incrementing every day, every day, every day. And then you take a step back and you're like, wow, holy shit, you know, six months ago, wow, things were so different. And it is, you know, it is different. You know, there's your hands are, are in a lot more different places back then. Right. You know, we're, we're still everybody here wears many hats, but, you, you know, it really was for like my job was, you know, 30 percent marketing, 30 percent product, 30 percent engineering um, and then 10 percent random stuff. And and today, you know, I'm definitely more focused on on running the company. And I also still focus about half of my time on, on product. My nights are all product. And so it's, it's changed in that sense, you know, where we, we have more people now. You know, we, we've got about 130 employees, whereas even just a year ago, we were probably 25 employees, 30 employees. And so scaling that up is, is definitely, you know, a challenge and, and it's, and it's, it's fun too. you know, hiring incredible people. We've got all, all really phenomenal people that, that are in, you know, in line with our vision and our, and our mission. So that's really how it changes the most is, is the people aspect. Uh, you know, of course there's, there's more problems today. You know, that, that's kind of like I mentioned earlier is, is my job has changed more to like a problem solver because when, when problems can't be solved, you know, in, in teams, they kind of, you know, bubble up to me. And, and, and that was, I would say that's the biggest difference. Beautiful. Beautiful. So, so you're working more 
it's interesting. I, I was going to say you're working to, to quote uh, uh, Michael Gerber in, in uh, the E-Myth. I was, I was going to say you're working more on the business than in the business, but I actually think you probably have a good balance of that even in the beginning because you understood what it meant to build something scalable and you didn't get too sucked into to, to the weeds there. That's powerful. Okay, so what advice would you give other SaaS entrepreneurs um, who are just getting started out? They, they have a vision to do everything for everyone uh, or they have a vision just in general for a, for a SaaS product or an app. What, what would you say? What would you tell them? For the everyone and everything thing, I, I you know, I honestly, I wouldn't necessarily, you really have to choose what, what, what tool you're building because it doesn't work for everything as far as every like use case, you know, you, we, we focused on productivity. So, so to mm -hmm. be clear, it's everyone for everything in the productivity space. It's all about your work. If you're focusing on something else, you know, it, it may not, it may not be valid there, but for us it was, and that's where I believe software is headed. So if you, and I, I'll, I'll put it more in, in kind of, um, anonymous terms is, is. If, if you're working on something where somebody tells you like, hey, this isn't going to work, that very well may be the case. So, so you know, don't be, don't be dumb about it, right? But also don't lose your vision. You know, if you have this vision and you really, you see it through and, and you yourself, this is the biggest test. If you yourself would use it, right? You, you yourself would use it right now. You're building it for you and you would use it in the future. Like look five years from now, you would use it when, you know, you're in completely different terms, then like, I would say, go for it, right? Try it, try it really, really. And really just don't, you know, don't be pulled into the pressure of, of the outside world. Um, the other thing I would say is focus on profitability, focus on the business. People have really lost the focus on the business and, and software. And, you know, when shit happens, right? Like when coronavirus comes around and you're seeing all of these companies lay people off. Why? Because they were just completely unsustainable. They were losing money. The biggest companies in the world that you think are so successful are losing tens of millions of dollars or hundreds of millions of dollars every month. That's not a business. That's not a real business. So, so focus on you know, the business fundamentals as well as everything else. And if you get that together, you're going to own your company um, much more than you would. You're not going to have somebody else controlling it and controlling your own destiny. Uh, and you're going to be a lot happier because there's not going to be as much stress. As soon as you hit profitability, you're like, okay, now I can breathe a little bit. Now I know I don't have this clock ticking in my head that I'm going to be out of money in, in 30, 60, 90 days. And your whole perspective is going to change. And, and that's the biggest piece I could give. Beautiful. Beautiful. I, I'm, I'm honestly super appreciative that you were here. I, it's funny. Our, our podcast manager, Tamsin, uh, her, her favorite thing, she, she comes from a company called Call for Content. That, that does podcast creation and they actually help us with our, our podcast creation. That That's one of the companies that introduced ClickUp to me. And she says, it is so fun to go in and type in the founder's name of ClickUp inside ClickUp. I, I mean, it's just so powerful what you're doing. I, I, I could not uh, recommend more uh, that the entrepreneurs listening pay attention to some of these, these extreme nuggets that we found here today in developing quickly and listening to your users. Honestly, thanks everyone for joining us here. Thanks, Seb, for, for, for the, the nuggets. We'll have to have you back on the show later when we talk some automation in a, in a future episode, uh, talking about automation specifically inside ClickUp and some of the things that you're doing there. This, this is some powerful stuff. Thanks for being here. Absolutely. Thanks so much for having me, Will. That's it, everybody, today for our episode of Automate, Delegate, Eliminate. And... Uh, Stick around for more guests, more SaaS companies as we begin to explore uh, the founder stories of more individuals who are changing our lives with pieces of software. You've been listening to Automate, Delegate, Eliminate, hosted by Paul Christensen.